So again, thanks one more time for people coming here. And uh, I'll try to talk about some general topics under the eyes of what we call the Houston view of it. But a lot of the topics when we talk about are covered by the people at Curie, by the people at Texas, by the people in all the other places. We have Sisdecker here. So everybody covers all these topics. So although I'll, I'll do maybe a Houston-centric talk, uh, I think that's important to remember that a lot of the things are going to bring up, you're going to hear from many, many different labs that work on, on similar subject. In order to put the but uh, the interface between theory and experiments, I'm going to try to focus in many points around the collaboration we have to have with the group of Aries Lieberman Aydan that tells you about this interface between theory and experiments coming together. And I hope this, this talk put together. Uh, uh, consider that I'm always run of time today, a little bit more flexible because I start a little bit early, but I'd always like to put the people actually the work on the first slide so I don't run off time on ignoring them. And I think uh, on the first slide, I think Peter and Aries have been the two senior faculties interacting with me on that. Uh, basically, here on the first column, we have the people that are now on professorial or research positions involved on this effort. And uh, basically, Michele now is at Northeastern. You're going to hear from him, Ryan Shang is at Kentucky now. Uh, Vinicius, that's a research scientist at Rice, is now is going to have a poster here. And Olga, I think this pointer is actually. Oh, yes, better. And Olga Duchenko, that's here. She'll be speaking in the afternoon in the place of Ares. That's a little bit late. His plane just got delayed, but so he's speaking the other day, but he's coming here. And uh, basically, she has been responsible for a lot of the collaboration with the experiments and basically, and I really appreciate uh, her patience of interacting with the theoreticians and basically going through the data and has been an enormous and, and great thing together. And in the bottom, I'm going to tell everybody's name just because I don't want to run out of time, but these are the people that currently work on the project at CTBP that, that uh, they have been involved. But for example, in a case, a lot of, most of these people are theoreticians, but for example, Ragini is an experimentalist, and is, for example, a student between me and Aries to have this idea of things coming together. So let's start with the talk. So I think basically everybody should, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to my thing too fast. What's going on here? Yes. Oh, okay, sorry about that. So everybody shows this slide about genome structure. I think we saw it on the last weekend. The students probably are tired of seeing it uh, in terms of, going, of, of doing all these things. And basically, when people talk about uh, the eukaryotic, let's, let's focus in the beginning on the human genome, and then I'm going to generalize a little bit as we move along. They have all this order from DNA to nucleosome formations. We are going to be on this talk moving around this area here where we talk about structures of chromosomes in general and maybe going to the full nuclei, but we're staying on that area. So to be more precise, we are going to try to, to talk about, uh, basically here is a famous photo about territory formation. The chromosomes are able to phase separate into the nucleus in the human chromosome at the interface. Okay, and, uh, and uh, we are going to try to use data that come from this technique called high c that's basically, that's a technique where basically you do cross-linking into DNA and from this cross-linking, from this ligand part to try to get information. And in our particular case, we are going to stay on resolutions of between 10 to 100 kilo, uh, kilo basis of resolution. That's the resolution we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about models. I'm going to talk about bids. So when I talk about a bid here, that's 50 kilo basis. So remember, we are far from just being we are not on the size of the full scale of the genome, but also not the size of nucleosomes. So just remember, nucleosomes we are talking about uh, on the idea of having about 200 kilobases. So these things are about, uh, if you divide 50 by, by 200, you're about 200, a few, like 200 uh, nucleosomes on, on, on 50 kilobases, okay? Just to keep this, to have, keep a scale of what we'll be talking about. The technique, I won't tell about it, the details, because there's gonna be enough people and you had an entire afternoon, the students had an entire afternoon about it. Most of the people here know about it, but also you're going to have a chance of learning a lot about how high c works, but pretty much comes from that. One thing I want to highlight here is that basically 
When you come to high C, and that's very important to be clear from, from the first part, is you are not looking at the structure of a single chromosome. Most of these experiments, you have about a million cells. So you're actually looking average over a million cells of this context. So when you look at this context, you're saying what's the likelihood of having a contact on there on this very heterogeneous group of that. We that came from protein folding sometimes have to self-educate ourselves to remember that base proteins tend to fold to unique or quasi-unique structures, okay? Chromosomes are much more liquid-like. They are much more, you have to treat as an ensemble and it's important, to, it's important to, to keep that in mind. When people try to sort of just to, to fit a, structure, a single structure into this data, sometimes people run into trouble because it's impossible, so let's keep that in mind. And again, there are lots of tricks. You heard from Michele, I apologize for the few who are not here, about how to interconvert this map into context, and you can do that. The other thing I want to highlight here is that basically, is that this is structure that you see here, this is a contact map that you're talking about. This context that you come from this geometrical exercise, from this experiment that tell where people are spatially contact, they're strongly connected to epigenetic markers. So there's a, long, there's a very close connection between structural data and epigenetic markers, and that's one thing that helps us try to identify these things. The first approximation I'll talk on the next slide is between heterochromatin and L-chromatin, but you can go in much more detail than that as we make those connections. Okay? The other thing is to remind you that basically if you get a person, me or Angela or anybody else, we have a single DNA, that means the difference of cell types comes from these different markers, come from these, from these epigenetic modifications. That's what actually classifies. So when we talk about the sequence here, we'll talk about in terms of these genetic modifications. And just an example, this is a lymphoblastoid cell that's GM1278, that's one of the most stable cells, that's basically where all the base calibration experiments have been done. But here's just an example, if you get, for example, IMR90, that's a pulmonary cell, you can start to see as you compare then, there there's a difference where the contacts are as you have a difference on the epigenetic marking of that. So let's keep that in mind, that there's the diff that's what differentiates cells and that's what comes. So before I talk models and I move uh, forward a little bit more, I want to highlight that basically that uh, as you look this map here, you start to observe, you can cluster into different patterns, these contact maps, and the original work from Rao, from Ares and all these people in the beginning, came to the idea that basically, this chromosome could actually be built in parts that phase separate. Uh, the base, what they call compartments, the base compartments were A and B, that are strongly correlated to eukaryotic, uh, to uh, eukromatin, and heterochromatin, but not, it's not 100%, but it's a good first approximation. But then these compartments can break into sub-compartments that tend to sort of to be happier, I use with A's, but they are actually different. And so these things tend to phase separate, and the question is how do you come from these maps and you get three-dimensional structures. So that's the goal. So when we got into the game on the old days, we had the idea basically, we did protein folding, why can't we do chromosomes? It's just a bigger polymer, and we couldn't be more wrong. Basically, it's, very, it's a very different problem. There are several things that are very useful. Actually, several tools are very useful, but like I said, the facts are leaked, they're dealing with ensembles, and the fact that you don't know precise what the interactions are, you come to a question. So, on those days, I think basically, uh, we tried to move in, uh, Bin Zhang, that unfortunately is not here, start, I'll start to work with Peter, then Michele Di Piero joined the group, and that's how we start to, to do models into, into this area. And this is sort of a summary of our, comp our, our current computational pipeline that we use to do work into this area. So if we can come in my chromosome, and I can understand if I just look my entire DNA, which parts, which of these beads that are 50 kilo bases, they belong to each one of these sub-compartments, types, A's or B. If I have that list, the first thing we did is, if I have this information about what the A's and B's are, or A1, A2, how can I get a three-dimensional structure? And we built a polymer model for that. I'm going to tell a little bit about it. 
But then what we learn afterwards, and that we learn from high CMAP, but what we learn afterwards is because there is a strong relation between the epigenetic information and these types or compartments, you can actually learn this from this information. So right now we have a pipeline where we start from chip seek information, the epigenetic information. We can predict the types and we can predict three-dimensional structure. And then from this ensemble of structures, we can say what the contact map associated with, and we can do direct comparison to high C. So in a sense, we're in a situation that basically now we can actually create a self-consistent mechanism where basically we don't really need to high C to do it. It's a way to figure out the model is in agreement with experiments, and there's a lot of things. And more than anything else, we now are trying to do in advance for cells that people don't have high C data yet, try to use theory to generate these maps and it's interesting to see how, as they come out, how these things come together. And that's all part of ENCODE. And basically, and that has been a really collaboration with us for a long time. Like I said, Olga has been involved on that from the beginning. We have been doing a lot of stuff on this part together. She's doing a lot of the experimental things coming together. So let me tell you a little bit about the model that we use for this part, for the physics part of the problem. So when we look at the data, we came to the conclusion that actually several terms that are involved when we make this Hamiltonian called micron, micron that comes through it, there are several terms that are involved. Basically, there's a homopolymer term that based there's the polymeric nature of the system. Uh, it's still a soft polymer because uh, since uh, DNA live in an environment where you have topo, they actually can cut through. So it, soft polar means that we allow the chains to cross each other. In our model, just for curiosity, since we have a lot of physicists here and people quantitative, we have about a bear about 4 kT, right? In order, what's the probability of cutting? But maybe that's a number you can change the model, and it's a number that's interesting to think about how these things can cut about it, okay? You have the second term, that's the phase separation term. That's a term that tells you that base, these A's and B's tend to phase separate from each other, A1, A2, you have that. There are the loops that base, I won't talk too much about that, I'll be glad to talk at the end just because time won't come on details, but base has these ideas, you know, you heard about when CTCF come together, Antoine gave us a very nice introduction to that, so I, th I think you guys can remember. But then there's a term, what we call the ideal chromosome, that I'll try to focus about it, and this term that we call the ideal chromosome is a term that's due to the polarization that you have, to the motorization that you have on, on DNA. So basically, these things where you have condensing, cohesion, they tend to condense or loops extrude. And this effect tells you that the first term I told you, the phase separation, is a term where you have spatial interactions. This is a chain interactions that tells you that beads that tend to be closer to each other, they attract each other. If you think from proteins, think about the alpha helix of proteins, when you have I, I plus four, the same idea, tells you that things are close, they tend to attract each other, they tend to condense, and more than anything else, they tend to form things that are sort of uh, helices of helices, I'll try to show a few more slides, they give this helical nature for the chromosomes as they come down, I'll discuss that a little bit later. I think this term is very important for the structure of it, but it's also very important to avoid a limited amount of knotting into, into, the, into chromatin. So you have these terms, the, just to first approximation, if you just ignore the loop for a little bit, you have these two terms. This term that comes from the chain interaction tells things they are close to the chain tend to attract each other. And that's basically, it's apparent from the data. If you look high C data, you see you have these very thick and strong diagonals that tells you that you have this term there, very there, the same way that you have this long range context that come from the phase separation into the problem coming together. So, since we don't have a, a real physical Hamiltonian, and remember that here, I'm telling you something that's a little bit incorrect, because I'm telling you this is due to motorization, that's a complete non-equilibrium phenomena, but I'm still going to treat it as a potential. So as we move to this scale of 50 kilobases, I have this effective potential. And uh, just to preempt the question, people are going to say what temperature means here. Temperature for us in these models is, act is the temperature that basically is able to explore the entire structural space that you're looking about. 
right? So if you leave fluctuations of which structures you're going around, that's how the systems come in as, as, you, probe, as you probe these things. So with this potential in hand, with this potential in hand now, we have a situation that basically now we have to learn the parameters of this potential. And remember, so I'm going to have these alphas and chi's and gamma for the ideal chromosome. They have to be learned. And in a sense, uh, that's something we did. And we tried to learn these potentials. We train on chromosome 10 of these lymphoblastoid cells. And that's why, because chromosome 10 for us was one that appeared to have most of the different uh, patterns that you need to learn from. And then what I'm going to tell you is after these patterns were learned, then we fixed that Hamiltonian. We actually change a little bit for species now and see if you change a little bit what's the consequences. But the idea is after this thing was trained, now you keep it as being our micron Hamiltonian with these potentials. And you have lots of posters of people around, including from my group, telling when you're right or you're wrong, how you should train, how you shouldn't do it. I think we're going to have a lot of chance to talk about it. My idea on the first talk is to bring these issues up and let people to think about it. And you have this in front of it. Now, just refreshing, I think, but in the power of repetition, that's why I told you about the fact these things are related to epigenetics. I want to point out that based now we can go to the second part, actually, discuss a little bit this part here we said, now can we go just from the epigenetic data and learn these A's and B's, and then I can feed into the Hamilton and just show you, and we can predict the structures. So that's the second part, that's the game, that's the game we are going to try to play. So this is something that basically is also a very active part on the group, it started by lots of conversations uh, with the people on the ARIS group, basically. We didn't even know in the beginning how to read chip -seq data, how to look in an organized way. And I think Ryan Shang is here somewhere. He's the first one that basically, together with Michele, started to look at these things. And I think, and now we have lots of people that are becoming professionals on, on, on dealing with that part. So the idea we had here is the following. So the great thing about coming from physics is that basically, you can use a lot of the tools you learned before in order to do things that you go afterwards. So what we said is the following thing. If I have a chromosome and I have all these different loci, and a loci here, what I call is my beads of 50 kilobases, right? So I'm talking about a new, okay? And now, for each one of these, I have a look of how much they have different epigenetic markers. The cheapest ones to do, and the ones you have more data, is histone modifications, right? But there are many other markers into chip seq right? So basically, so I think that you have, and here's a bunch of histone modifications you have, you have seven, is important. Now, I want to highlight that again, because there was a question about it. What we need here doesn't mean that if I give you a list of some chip seq information here, I'm telling you that these are the important terms that define that particular interaction. All I'm telling you is that by looking at this data, I have enough information to differentiate if that bead is A1, A2, B1. So what I'm looking for here at this level is not a deep understanding of understanding exactly how these different proteins are involved. The interaction may be very complex. That's one thing that happens on chromatin. They are not trivial interactions. People know here. We have a lot of experimentalists on this thing. They know how complicated protein for say, Oh, you have a hydrogen. Here you have all these protein mediate interactions. You have all, uh, all these motors. But that is you me that basically, based on these modifications, enough of them is sufficient for me to identify which are the A1, A2, and B that can feed my Hamiltonian. So, what, uh, what Ryan did at that time, he was working on the protein world, and he came and said, how about if I call this line that tells me which type do I have here, A1, A2, and the second position are all these experimental values. Tell me how is strong the experimental signal for each one of them. And I call that a sequence. And now I can look all these different sequences in parallel, and the same way he did with covariance, into contact prediction into proteins, we can do the same thing here to predict these types. So the nice thing is this problem can be mapped exactly into what people call a POTS model. So a POTS model is telling you that basically uh, 
now each position on the, on the chain is like what's the orientation of a spin, and then how these things interact around, okay? So basically, so what we break it, each signal that we have here, we break the signal that you get from chip seek. We break it on beads, 20 beads or 21 beads, just like the proteins, or as many beads as you want. And each one of these beads, you call one orientation of that spin. And now you can correlate the things intensity with the sequence and predict the types. So this game basically worked quite well by having this association of basically orient as you break these beads, and you have this plot Hamiltonian, and in the end, you can start to do predictions. So the nice thing about this covariance is that I'm not looking for each locus, how it's interacting with each experiment, but also I'm getting the covariance between experiments. So I'm really improving the data by getting this idea that I'm not, I'm actually including all this in, uh, all this information in a much deeper level. I will tell you a bit about, uh, you can look for more complex patterns, but these are the patterns that I include here. So this slide is just an example shown here in the case of a piece of chromosome two that tells you that basically what is the levels, basically is the color. Try to think about the red ones are more A-like, the blue ones are more B-like with, with variations. And you can see that you have a fairly good prediction between if you compare high C to the to our prediction model. Because we have some sequence, there are some reasons that we tend to be a little bit more granular that, than the experiment, but that's good enough in order to predict structures. One thing I want to point out to people that basically people haven't worked for polymers is sometimes you look at high C data. And as long as you, your agreement with the data is reasonably good, you can get the structure because you have the constraint of the polymer. And the constraint of the polymer really makes your life very robust as you're predicting structures. Basically, if you have a few, a large number of long range contacts that are correct, the system can sort of self correct itself much more because of that. So you see that can do quite well. So if I'm able to do these predictions, we are very happy. Now, when this field started, people say, why use your model? Basically, actually, the first papers that came around the CTVP, when Bing Sheng and Peter were there, they actually were doing the full inversion of these high C maps and tried to get all the parameters out of it. Antonio is very involved on doing these things now. And it's kind of cool that basically these things are actually self-consistent. The micro model is actually a fairly good model. If I just, I can do very deep comparisons between doing a full inversion, make sure if this break into few categories compared to the full inversion is good. But this, I just want to show one slide on that because I'm, that tells you that if I predict the A's and B's, basically from this full inversion and I look what you get from experiment or from our predictor, these things tend to be in very good agreement. Right, so that's, that comes by looking the, the, the first eigenvector of this, of this map. And, uh, and these things sort of, uh, that's the work that Antonio Oliveira is doing these days, this comparison between these methods, but I think that's a very important thing to keep in mind. So now, if I have my Hamiltonian and I believe it's good enough and I'm happy with it, I can have this pipeline that we have, that we have put in place. And, uh, and this pipeline just tells you, we start with cheap thick tracks, you predict the, ta the these things, and now I can predict the ensemble of structures. And that's what we are doing. That's why we're doing an encode now. That's what I do for many, many different cell lines. We are producing these structures. It's gonna be a very interesting thing as more data is coming out from imaging to see how wrong or how right we are. But that's a very nice way that basically to do these predictions at, the, at this time, it, it is along. I want to point out one thing. When you just look at uh, single chromosomes. Maybe Ryan Shang was talking about it. I'm not talking about the structure of the entire nucleus, but if you look at individual chromosomes, it's very interesting that when we do the simulations, here's a very old slide from a very old paper, tells you, first of all, they really phase separate and form transform territories, and also in general, you have more A's on the surface and more B's inside. Doesn't mean it's 100%, but there's a distendency of having the active part of genome to be more exposed. When you go to the nuclear part, it's a little bit more complicated, but just to point this out. And also that this model alone is good enough to tell that these things are, they're not free, but they have very little nothing. Here's a calculation of the results of the model that tells you basically the number of knots that you'd have 
at this resolution, if you have a homopolymer, compare what we have in our case when we have a much smaller numbers. So basically, so just this Hamiltonian, particularly because of the ideal chromosome term and all these parts, tend to make the systems very annoyed. These are old slides. So now, like I said, if you can predict these three-dimensional structures, you can now come and you can actually compare to experimental data. So you compare to high C and see how well we do it. Uh, you have to be very careful in these comparisons because people try to do global comparisons and basically it's very easy to get things around the diagonal correct. But you also have to do comparisons when you're very far from the diagonal, right? Basically, here's the diagonal of these maps. Basically, you have the simulation results like in here, you have the experimental ones, you have to compare these things. So what's very nice about looking at these maps is that you can start to get a feeling. You see, you get these patterns in terms of A1, A2, B2, and this phase separation quite well, but it's not going to be like 100%. You see that basically these experiments, because of this discreteness of the A's and B's, tend to be a little bit more sharper, but the overall features are very, very similar. You can see here we're comparing two different regions and you're getting more or less exactly the same regions as, as they sort of phase separate in the proper way in the proper structure. So the nice thing now is that basically similar comparisons now can also be done to other different cell lines and you can start to see if that potential that was learned on chromosome 10 of a single cell line now can I use for other cells and we do reasonably well. And I think I won't go all the details, but this is the comparison between the A's and B's and the predictions and things do reasonably well. So now I want to stop and say, when we had that, and in our collaboration with the lab, with the Librium Eiden lab there, we decided that basically we have to create lots of tools in order to make them available for the community to be there. And you're going, if you go on the posters here for the people that came from CDB, you're going to see a lot of it. So the first thing I want to highlight to people is based this website, the nbb.rice.edu, is sort of, a, uh, Antonio is one of the main, but everybody's involved on it. Uh, I was typing all the names, Antonio, you're lucky enough that I sort of run out of time, I just had your name here, but I should have had everybody else here. But uh, what's very nice is into this website, we have all, this information, and also now we are transferring all this information, at least part of this information to the ENCODE website. Okay, and so all this in there, but we have all this chip seek information that's in there, not only basically uh, Ragini, that's in the group, but her name there is also now doing what we call together with Olga, this entire, uh, this entire uh, human atlas with all these different cells and all these things, and basically, so this website not only has all the information, but it has all the software. And that means that basically you can use our software as you can change it. For example, say, oh, I want to change the 4KT by 4, 2KT because I just reduce or increase, or you can change any parameter you want to do it for the sake of your experiments. Uh, by the way, our software became extremely fast these days because of a lot of work, there's been a lot of computational work. We have now what I call open micron, that basically we run into, into the structure of open MM. That means if you want to run some of the simulations and you have a GPU, this is awfully fast. Based on a single GPU in a cheap computer, people can tell you, you can run these things, do quite well, and the software is all set there. Basically, it's all set there, ready to run, and it's sort of a very useful tool. I think, I don't want to go into all details with the tool, the people are here, I don't have time. I want to say that also the Megabase, that's the one that makes the predictions of the types. Now they have what called Pi Megabase, that basically Esteban that's here is the main person behind it, is actually doing a much better job in sort of including a little bit more correlations into the Hamiltonian, but also make it much more efficient also, Pi Megabase do things like, for example, imputation that sort of a predict back areas of high C data that you don't have on some things that you can sort of generate information for that. And it's a very efficient thing. It's also all involved. You can find all these things into in, into in, in DB. Now, using these tools, we are now, like I said, with Encode, we are actually creating all these different cells, basically. Right now, I think the last I heard, we had 54 different human cells, fully done, all details, all the structures. Uh, 
if uh, while I was in Spain, have good food in San Sebastian, my group was a little bit faster, maybe we would have more sales done by now. I don't know what the number is now, but they can tell you is, is sort of uh, very nice things that these things are just, we're generating all this data and we are making this available. And the, the nice thing is also in close collaboration with the Ares lab, I think uh, Base Demos and other people in there have been involved in create what they call a spacewalk and a new browser where actually you can go to the data, just get part of the data and read on this web-based way you can actually see this, this simulation. It's actually a major computational task that people put together, but all this data is very easy to visualize with the, in a very fast way without having to download all the data going through this sort of uh, uh, web server. Okay. So how am I doing on time? Okay, so that's it, more than I need, or more than I deserve at least. Uh, so, so I want to, to change topics to say one of the nice things here, and I think we got a fantastic lecture yesterday, but you're going to hear more. If you guys haven't shown for the school, you missed this opportunity, but Antoine gave a beautiful lecture yesterday about all these sort of imaging techniques and how you deal with these problems, basically. And, uh, and one of the nice things about it is that basically these are sort of very complementary experiment to these high C experiments, right? I told you basically these high C experiments have been doing multiple cells, ligation experiments. Here you are trying to do the image of things, trying to do multiple images. There's lots of difficulties on these things, basically present all the technical difficulties they have, but they are very complementary. For us, this was very nice because basically, at least we can honestly say that all the training of our potentials and everything never saw this experimental data. So in a sense, you can say, oh yes, but it has its own chromosome 10, but it was trained on high C. You can, I know it's basically, it's, that's not true, but basically here is really a case where you can use something that was trained in one experiment and apply to a completely different situation and you are uh, you're happy to do it. Uh, the first person basically, uh, Ryan Shang is here, he was the first one that got deep into, into this problem. Like I said, a lot of these things the group collaborate, everybody is everybody, but there's always someone that's the main defender of the cause. And uh, Ryan actually got in there. And what the nice thing is, there are lots of new results on that. And I think you're going to hear from Ryan Sheng talks. He's probably going to tell you about all these imaging things. So I'm going to talk just about the old stuff, just to prepare your spirit and uh, to help him on that. And what he did is based when people were looking at these particular two segments of chromatin, that basically, and, uh, and, uh, how, and how these things work. So these two segments that basically came on Shuawei's Wang lab, where they first did it, what's very interesting is that basically, the first thing they were very, I talked to her the first time, she said, oh, we get these structures and they're all different. Every time I do an imaging, we get a different structure. Yes, we have an ensemble, that's not a protein. Right, so basically you're not going to get a single structure. So what Ryan did is actually look, for example, now we can simulate this entire genome, the entire chromosomes that she's looking, and I can look at the segment from our simulation, and we can do the, the direct comparison to the ensemble of structures that you have there. So now you can not only look at the experimental data, but you can compare that. The not very nice thing about the data is that basically there are two segments. Segment one was very interesting because a segment that includes many, many genes. And segment two is a segment that includes any genes, basically. So what you observe is that you look at this thing, there, there's no structural feature that, that's very apparent for segment two, but for segment one, you look that they form this sort of two big things like, like this dumbbell that actually appears to exist open or and in 5% of the time or some short percent of the time is actually closed. And I think I can go uh, uh, excruciate details like Ryan did yesterday on the, on the lecture and you're going to see on, on him let's compare actually more complicated data on, on comparison. But the nice thing is that basically, like I said, both experimentally and uh, the direct one, if I look segment ones, they have sort of this different, they can sort of be packed 
and each of these structures here is sort of some of the clusters that you get, are typical things from the five clusters that you got to look at this data. You have this closed dumbbell and you have this simulate one, and you see the percentage is more or less the same. So you have more or less the percentage, that means the, the free energies are very similar. Okay, so these things actually compare well. If you look at these things, there's a very good comparison. If you look at range of duration, there are lots of other things. You can look at this queue that tells you what's the RMSD between different bids in there, and they compare quite well. But one of the interesting things that we get here is based every time people are looking, can I look some function out of it? And here we can have the kindergarten version of trying to get some function from it that's very interesting that if you look at this particular segment one, the genes are all located on this linker between the dumbbells. So it's kind of interesting, you can imagine that basically you're opening or exposing this large collection of genes by this open and closing mechanism. That's why I call the kindergarten mechanism. But you start to see some possibilities in terms of how the structural and dynamics of these chromosomes have to do it, and also why these chromosomes tend to be dynamical things that they may, a different situation, try to expose one part and try to expose uh, another part. Another very interesting thing that came from this study from Ryan is to say that basically, if you look part, there are three cells on the same region of that, uh, that we have on the segment, and you see some of these regions are A and some of these regions are B. When you look at the 3D structures, clearly the A regions tend to come to form and the B regions goes inside. So this, this minor modification can actually change the overall structure in order to try to expose these A active regions outside, and that's something that I just... Uh, want to point out here. Now, what I'm going to tell you now, I'm going to let Olga tell you more in details because it's based, all the credit should go to her, is basically it's a big collaboration we had with people and I think it's a very interesting uh, work that basically Olga was involved there as well, but also with Ben Roland groups in, in, in Holland. I will tell what they did. But Olga has been involved on this sort of what we call the DNA zoo, that's not only get the sequences for all these different species, we're actually going to tell you about the beautiful method how they use high C together with all these things to sequence these things, but also to understand the structures uh, of these sequences. And basically, on this paper that we published based about a year and a half ago, we've, we visited many, many species and uh, what you're trying to do here on every corner, I'll be a little bit more clear about it on the next slide, we start to observe that basically we, we could for the first time to start to classify these general architectures of the genes. So when you look at the human chromosome, you start to observe that you have these chromosome territories and you phase separate and you have these well-defined territories. But if you look at other species, they prefer to break the territories at the expense of forming clustering of centromeres or cluster of telomeres or forming polarized uh, telomeres, centromere X, I'm going to show you here. And what you observe, and I will, I'll try to show you on the next one, is that basically these tend to have, the ones that tend, the species that tend to be form phase separation, they have to be more motorized. It's what the term we call the ideal chromosome tend to be stronger in order to do that. So just to highlight a little bit here, uh, basically, let me show you the next slide. Uh, this is just a slide for you to have an idea. When you have chromosome territory, these things come apart. Uh, when you have the central telomere base here, they tend to form a blob, they come to come together, or you have the situation where the central mirrors and telomeres separate from each other and they form this polarized version that you have. And here is just basically how this high C map that I show on the other figures too small looks for each one of these types. Basic, you can see that basically when you have lens wide compartments, you can see these compartments quite well, while the ones when you have the central mirror telomere axis here uh, and uh, and basically, and you have, when you have centromeres collapse, they tend, the clustering, you tend to see this full cluster, all the centromeres coming together, right? You see these big, strong points between different chromosomes that tells you that all these centromeres are coming together. Now, uh, several people in the group, particularly Sumita Brahmasha, decided to do a model to investigate that. And basically, the model, basically, it's a simplification 
of Micron, where he put all the terms we had there, but the difference is he put uh, here, in this case, is five ideal chromosomes, and he put all the beads with the same attraction, with the difference that interaction with the centromeres are slightly stronger. Okay, and what he does with this chromosome, that's based on simplification, what you observe is the following. Uh, depending on your last Y compaction, that means how strong is your ideal chromosome, you start to observe that basically if you have weak term, if this last Y is weak, you tend to have these centromeres tend to cluster together. And you lose territories, very weak territories. And you start to stress that part, you start to see the territories start to get formed, and, uh, and uh, base the centrum is trying to cluster together. Now, this is nice because that's all consistent with the data of the DNA zoo. But what completed this entire discussion was this work by the Ben Roland group, where they actually got the human chromosome, okay, and they start to weaken condensing, right? So basically, and by doing that, you can see that you go from wild type, where basically in red are interchromosome contacts, in blue are intra, uh, intra is red and inter is between. You see that basically when you weaken these things, you see they start to get these strong points as the centromeres coming together. So you start to destroy a little bit the territories at the expense of the centromeres coming together. So like we love to say, you make a human to become a fly. Okay, so you have this transformation of species here, into, at least at the level of looking the chromosome. So that's a very nice story. Now, I think there's a lot of questions that uh, uh, you, can, you can put together in order, in order to think about it, how these different architectures actually are functionally involved. That's a big question that I hope that based, that's one of the big questions into the, what all is running on the DNA zoo. And that's one of the things that basically uh, we are getting and we are moving together. I think it's a very good question, it's open to us. Uh, as, as I have not been too courageous here, I have stay out of dynamics. There's a lot of how dynamics is important here. I stay much more on the structural features here, basic. I could talk about dynamics, but that would be an entire new talk on this opening one. I decided to stay more on the structural features of the problem, but there are lots of interesting questions that, uh, uh, that people have seen about that. I just want to finish by saying that actually we are working on many other things. Uh, people are getting interested on many different species. Uh, right now we are interested on ancient species. That's something Olga is very interested in it. And uh, one of the things we did recently, just of curiosity, by looking at different species basically, is, is this particular mosquito I had Egypt, basically. Uh, if, uh, if you come from Brazil, People know a lot about this mosquito if you live on dengue land and all these diseases that's based as the vector for all these ugly diseases. And uh, you start to observe that now this is the kind of thing we can start looking in terms of this entire possibilities that I just discussed you before. You can start to see a sort of interaction that come from telomere, telomere, centromere, centromere. You see this anti-diagonal term that tells the things are going back and forth. Okay, so from these things here, it tells you this thing is probably polarized. Okay, and Vinicius now try to sort of train from scratch entire new system based, train from this entire system based. Also, this mosquito, if you think about it, has some very big chromosomes. Programs that are very large, much larger than human chromosomes. There are only four chromosomes here, I believe, right, Vinicius? There are four chromosomes, right? Well, oh, three and six, I'm sorry, see? Uh, so basically, one of them is actually very large. Uh, what's very nice is that basically, if you just look this here, you try to build a cartoon, you believe the chromosomes are going to have to organize in a way like I'm showing here, right? Based trying to put the centromeres on one end, the telomeres on the other end. And uh, since I'm out of time here, I don't want to go off the full details here just to finish. I want to say that basically, if you look at the simulation, you actually get this polarizing. But what's very nice, and basically Vinicius can tell you more on his poster, I don't know if he's talking about it or other things, is that basically, although these things tend to form this polarized version with the centromeres and telomeres, they don't, these mosquitoes, they don't fully destroy 
the territories. They actually have, they're not very nice, smooth territories, but you can see here from the colors, they tend to be elongated more than circular because they have it, but then to be very elongated. And also at this interface, the structure that makes sense here is much more mitotic like than you expect for the interface. And you actually can see it if you look at the data. Remember what I told you about helices of helices before? You can actually see when you just measure the helix of this thing, you have these two well-defined, right? The short helix and the whole helix. So you have this short helix and you make this long helix at the top of it. And, uh, and show that structure. Here is just a slide to show these things coming together. And one of the interesting things I just want to put here and uh, as an observation and not as a conclusion is that, for example, these chromosomes tend to be much more sensitive to force. If you apply force on them, you see that basically they tend to deform much more while the human chromosome, you start to unfold the end of it. You don't see this sort of full extension. What makes sense from the structure I showed you is all those helices, but you have this much stronger force dependence. And it's going to become an interesting thing as you look at these chromosomes and they are living on lots of force interacting, how much they're tetra. I haven't talked about dynamics. I have lots of people that can talk much more than I can do about it. But how this force environment may change their function may affect everything. So with that, I already spoke more than I should. I think I give an introduction of what based on the ways of theory and experiment coming together. Like I said, we are going to have several talks about several other models. And you can say why my is better, why my is better, why the other is better. You're going to hear a lot about it. You have lots of experimental data. I tried to focus on a little bit of them some microscopy and some and high C data, try to come to different species, but I think I hope that helps as an introduction. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, really, really great talk. And actually on this slide, I'm really curious about this because um, I mean, one, you, you know, there are some of these observations for, by like Dennis Disher, where they look at stem cell differentiation uh, from different, in different mechanical environments. And usually this is like elasticity of the substrate. I guess what I'm wondering is, could you, could you, can you maybe give some sense as to whether um, these differences in large scale response uh, for these two different species could perhaps lead to different sort of phenotypic responses to external mechanical pressures and whether or not, you know, how, how that could like translate to differentiation or changes in expression due okay. to these sort of large scale mechanical differences. Okay. So the answer is yes, yes, yes. But now let's try to go a little bit more in details. Uh, basically you are correct. Doesn't mean we know all the, all the details that, that come with it. So first of all, I think the, the nice thing about the work I just showed you on that paper on the DNA zoo or all the species plus the work of Ben Raylon is to show you that basically you have these different architectures and, uh, and they depend on the level of motorization. So it means the cell can control that thing as needed, basically. We always say, oh, you put condensing to go to the mitotic level, but they actually, we know very little. I think you can have these things doing control at all levels by creating more motors and less motors uh, uh, as, as we come along. So that's the first part of it. So basically, I think the organisms have a chance of changing their architecture. So the question is, when we do most of the experiments right now, we are looking at cells in a particular type. If we have cells under different stress and things like that, it's just basically the, the chromosome being effect on that structure, or you may even change the structure because you may have a, a cue to change your structure to go somewhere else. That's the first part. So like clearly, these things are, are correlated. Do we know how? We can guess a little bit, but we, we don't. At the, uh, but, uh, uh, at the, but continue, uh, continue on this argument. You, you have to think about it that basically uh, these cells, uh, these architectures are there, and why some architectures are force dependent. So here is just like, for example, an observation we did when we did that structure. So the idea is we did this structure. When you're done with the structure, applying the entire protocol I showed in the beginning, I say, what happens if you apply force to it? And that's what I observe. That's not a deep study. That's one figure on, on a big paper, but that gives you a clue why in some case things are more force-sensitive and less force. And I think that's basically, we know there's a lot of 
four skills on cell formation is going to come there. Herbie someone loves it. He basically probably talk a little bit more about it. So how these things get related is a very interesting question. So clearly, the genome can play around with this structure by bringing motorization, other things. And the question how that does phenotypic change, I don't know, but clearly it, it is related, right? And we have to understand a little bit more about it. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Um, so when you infer the 3D structure with your model and then you, you have a simulated high CMAP, uh, I'm wondering because your 3D structure is like a snapshot. You're creating a snapshot. Uh, I'm wondering if your model, uh, you're also including the dynamics of the domains. For okay. example, uh, in single cell, we see, we compare the cells, we see that for uh, a confirmation, uh, this uh, confirmation is not always the same. There's some dynamics. Do you include that or okay. can we have a measure of it? So let, let me tell you. First, I apologize if it was not clear enough. When I show a structure here, it's just a snapshot of ensemble of configurations we have. Okay, so I, like I said here, you cannot have a single structure. What I'm trying to show is a typical one of an ensemble of confirmations you have. If you go to ENCODE or NDB, one of the reasons takes in order, we had to work on this method to do, we, we put 100,000, there's 100,000 structure for every configuration in there. Now, that said, that said, I'm going to step back a little bit and tell you that basically these 100,000 structures we are getting it are structures that basically sample the entire configuration space as far as we are concerned. There are dynamics of micron, but there's no reason to believe the dynamics observed here is the same dynamics you observe in vivo, okay? So I will look at this 100,000 structure much more as an ensemble of the possible structures than actually look at the details of the dynamics. I think a lot of people here know more about the detail of the dynamics. So I think you have many structures. We present them. If you go to encode the NDB, they are there about it. For each one, we generate about 100,000. That's what we have to at least to be able to reproduce a good high C map. If you go to the poster, people can tell you how many of these you need. If you think the high C experiment have about a million cells, is that a good number, Olga? Right, so you think about that's what you have. So I, with that, I think it's really an ensemble. What I show here in the figures are just one typical. Then in, in all the data present these things. Hey, um, very nice talk. It's impressive what you can do with these types of methods. Uh, I have a very simple question regarding the model, uh, sort of the minimal chroma, chromosome model, I think you call it. Um, What's the polymer model you use before you add all the forces? Is it just like a strand passing chain or do you conserve topology as well? It is basically, there are different homopolymers model can use. We use a very simple one. Michael can give you all the details, but I think we just use a typical bead. It's, it's what is a, just a Rouse chain or with? My, my question is whether you allow strand passing. Yes, yes. What do you have? You have a soft core. With an energy benefit. Okay, so, so you what do the, allow it strand passing. So what the two okay, bid? Okay. Let you want to answer. Okay, okay. Okay, great. It's basically, it's not a hard core. It is a soft core. It's a barrier of 4KT. So it means they, these two bits can actually get into the top of each other and cross themselves. Yeah, so I can take advantage and ask a question in the meantime, just because I should know the answer to this, but I don't, but I don't. So uh, I always was very impressed by the mapping from the epigenetics to the compartment structure. What's the status of being able to read off the loop structure from epigenetic marks or CTCFs or, or things like that? How far has that uh, sort of progressed? Okay, uh, I think uh, that's something we have been progressed less because the experiments took a little bit longer, but people are getting very good about predicting loops now. And there are additional loops in addition to CCCF come, uh, start to appear now. But I'll tell you that's an area that at least us have done very little progress because basically the CCCF loops, you, you can almost look at them quite well, basically. You can look your entire prediction without loops and then look around on that prediction where the CCCFs are coming together, you can do a reasonable job. But if you stay on 50 kilo bases, a lot of the loops are smaller than 50 kilo bases, so it's not a problem. So at, at that level, we can do it, right? You can basically, you don't, do, you don't predict the loops. You do it, and they look on the structure, predict without loops, where the loops can get formed. But there are lots of other loops that are appearing now, and I think basically heard from Antoine's talk, and, and Olga has lots of new stuff on that. I think this data now is pushing to, to make the, math, to the model to do it. So, with that said, I'll tell you that the overall structure 
of the system at 50 kilobays resolution, let's be clear, is very good even if you don't include the loops okay. at that level, right? But as soon as you go a little bit down, you really have to be detailed on it. Yeah, actually, it's related to Enrique's uh, question. Um, I was wondering how much, uh, yeah, what is the impact of the strand passing? I mean, can you tune this, and what will be the consequence if you uh, allow more strand passing or less strand passing? Okay, I think we basically we uh, w at this level, at this level, uh, the amount of crossing is first of all. There are different ways that you can do about it. One is, do you really want to understand the effect of uh, topo, or do you really want to do better sampling? Okay, and uh, the level of topo is very important in order to, to figure out how many knots you have the, here. Uh, but, uh, but in our case, uh, this number tends to be more or less in agreement with the time scales that you observe experimentally. That's how, how that calibration is done and also to, to get into sampling. But uh, if, you, if you, for example, turn it off completely, your sim system is going to get entangled and you're not, based, at least on the times of our simulation, going to be able to relax. You could in principle believe maybe if you wait forever, you may be able to sample everything, but that's not the case. Peter had a comment? Well, I was going to say, uh, uh, if you turn off the uh, uh, that's allowed by 4KT, the equilibrium structures are sampled and they're knotted. And there are no knots in these structures at this uh, level of resolution. So um, it, it, it seems that the reason you have, not, uh, you have no knots has nothing to do with starting with no, unknotted configurations. No, and knots are, of course, more common in a true equilibrium sample, and that with that size barrier, you more or less can equilibrate knots. Hello, I have a question about uh, sampling and loops. Because there are some work I'm thinking about CC, I'm thinking about b -streaky. They say that certain interactions are very transient. So supposedly they last uh, very little, eh, but they are important for biology. So why not to set the limit of sampling? Like, can we catch these transient interactions? Okay, I think uh, 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 the question about uh, depends on, on what you call catching transient interactions, basically. Uh, uh, you, uh, so, if, if you look, for example, the work that uh, we did on the imaging, on the segments that I showed before, you really don't have an equilibrium with structure that's actually closed structure. It's something that's a few, it's a couple KTs high, right? So, basically, you really have to look at excite state to be functional. So I think in some cases we can get it. Can we always get it with this amount of sampling? That's a very good question. I, I can't answer that. But in some cases that we have this opening, closing, and things like that, we have been able to get it. Hi, great talk. Um, it sounds like these methods have been used um, primarily to look at interphase chromatin structures. I'm curious if um, it's also been applied to understand mitotic chromosomes or chromosomes at different stages in the cell cycle and perhaps even the transitions between um, structures at different points in the cell cycle. Okay, uh, I think that's a fantastic question and we are very interested on it. We have some studies moving on that that should be done, but are not done yet. Uh, and, uh, and, but just to make a comment, uh, if you think about it, uh, I may have a Hamiltonian that's similar to the one I showed before for these different stages of the cell cycle, but the problems are not going to be the same. Clearly, if I go to my thotic state, my level motorization is much higher, and, and the parameters have to be trained there. So what you have to do on the cell cycle that we believe that what you're doing is basically, we still have the same skeleton, the same format, the same terms for the Hamiltonian, but the parameters are slightly different because this competition between the phase separation terms and the ideal chromosome becomes different and, and basically and that's something that's being trained and then you should be able to go in there. Now, the interesting question comes on the cell cycle, and I think you got some comments also yesterday from Antoine's talk, is basically, if I get all these structures at different stages of the cell cycle, can I understand how I move from one to the other on the time scales you have in there, and basically how much memory is maintained during the thing? That's a very nice quote, an open question we would like to answer. 
So I just want to make a comment, basically. Peter was, was, uh, was commenting about not information. I think it's correct that basically the system can find these unknotted states with 4K T very fast as, as you come down, but the, the fact of having, the, but that's a question of sampling and getting there and looking at the states that you're visiting down there. But I think uh, having the ideal chromosome really, these local interactions really reduce the number of amount of knotting you get in there if you just have zero on that interaction.